Hello, everybody. Hey, everyone. Welcome to my channel. It's Carrie Mortician. This is where we do just live chat. Um, typically, I'm drinking coffee, but it's into the noon time. So not going to be drinking coffee right now. I'm going to pass on that. <laughs> Don't need more caffeine right now. Um, just hopping on, just going to do our live chat for the week. And then on Friday, uh, about four o'clock Eastern Standard Time, join again for a live chat, but it's going to be live with Josh, the crematory operator again. Last week's live, getting to ask a crematory operator questions went so great. You guys loved getting to throw your questions at him, dive into the cremation side of things. So I told him we're, we're doing it again. Get ready. So this Friday worked for um, both our schedules. So we're going to do again on Friday. So join us here for that and bring all of your questions about cremation and all things cremated remains. So good morning, everybody, or good afternoon now here. Um, welcome. So our first question that someone had posed to me was, um, is it okay to tip a funeral director. So not a made up question. <laughs> I'm not looking for tips for Carrie. Um, more so just, uh, let's see, Joanne had asked this. When my husband passed away in April of 2020, the funeral director we worked with was so great. He came to my house to pick up the clothing for my husband. After the cremation, he was kind enough to take his cremated remains to the cemetery and many other things. So I sent him a gift card for all of his great service. Is this okay? Of course it's okay. Um, well, I should say, you know, in some areas it might not be allowed or some funeral homes might not allow their staff to receive tips. But I think it's a kind gesture even just to send a thank you card. Thank you cards are a little getting antiquated. People don't even send thank you cards for wedding gifts and all of that anymore. So a thank you card is really nice. It's nice to be thanked, even if it's just your job. It's nice to know that what you do makes an impact. So thank you cards are great. Um, gift cards, wine, things like that. I've, I've known a lot of different things that have been given to funeral directors um, over the years. Some of it is um, whiskey, things like that. Um, hold on, I'm going to shut my door. I had a, uh, some flooding in the outside my office. So I've got some big fans going, trying to dry out the carpet. Um, yeah, Sugar Magnolia. Thank you cards are a lost art. And I love mail. I think mail is super fun. There's something just loving about opening the mailbox and there being something there for you that's not a bill. <laughs> so I'm a big fan of mail and things like that anyway. Um, thank you, Janet. And so uh, there are some places where the cemetery staff, the vault company, the drivers are expect to be tipped by the funeral director. Um, and so there are certain places I would completely fail because I wouldn't know these things. But certain states, because sometimes when people are union, um, so there are different things in different areas. So definitely what I'm seeing is not cross the board true when it comes to certain things. Some places expect tips, some you cannot receive tips. I'm in the middle zone where something is always nice. I think a gift card is nice because it's not somebody walking up to you and handing you a $10 bill where you're more going to be inclined saying, no, thank you. Cause it does feel inappropriate. Like, hi, I just buried your loved one. Here's $10 cash. It feels a little weird. Um, where, a gift card later thanking you for going above and beyond or making someone feel better during that moment. It is. It's nice to do. Oh, Heidi, I'm so sorry. Hey, Deanna. Do funeral homes keep chaplains on staff or on call? Not typically, but some funeral homes do have clergy or officiants, um, celebrants that they may either have on staff or 
use frequently to the point that, you know, they're almost a part-time full employee because of that, even though they're not really, they're not being paid by the funeral home per se. It's money coming from each family that is going to the person. So we have our direct, we gave our director a bouquet of flowers. She was wonderful through the process and helped every way. That's awesome. Even though we're around flowers every day and maybe it's not the first thing we would choose. Getting flowers is nice. It's the act of, the act of someone going out of their way for you. I think it's the same like with relationships. You know, getting flowers is not going to be my first choice, but someone going out of their way to give me even a Kit Kat candy <laughs> bar, it means something. Um, you want to know that someone thought of you purposefully. And that's a big deal. At Christmas last year, the hospital, my father passed away and sent us a letter. I took all the firemen and EMTs, Christmas cookies and candies. Oh, that was very nice of you. After my loved one's funeral, I sent the funeral home an edible arrangement with a thank you card. Well, and that's the thing, Elizabeth. I think you hit on a key point with this. Staff appreciates good food and staff appreciates things where if you're just thanking the funeral director, all the other people behind the scenes that maybe you don't even see the graphics, the people who do all the printing, the videos, the death certificates, answering the phones, all those people can get, um, they see that and they can also um, get a thank you from something. If you send like a bouquet of edible food or, you know, something like that. So I think that's really nice. Super nice people. You guys are all super nice. I want to serve your family. You guys seem like you appreciate the work that they have done, the funeral directors and stuff. That is super awesome. Um, so let's see here. My name is Mary. I've been funeral. I love... I've been in the funeral home life for 15 years. If is what helped you get up in front of a crowd without being nervous. I think just repetition. It's like doing these videos. I remember sitting in my living room, getting ready to record my first Facebook live video to answer some questions. And it was just my family and friends that could watch me, obviously, on Facebook. I was terrified. The thought of a live event, whether it's on camera or in person, it's not like you can quick redo it. It's a, here it is, whatever happens, happens, whatever I say is said, you can't take it back and edit it. Like it's just going to happen. So like a funeral is a one-time thing. Um, you're not getting really a second chance at doing that if you're getting up and speaking. And so, yeah, it is terrifying the pressure and magnitude of the moment, not just the act of what you're doing, but the whole moment in itself. Um, and so I think the repetition and knowing what you're doing is the right thing, knowing what you are going to say, feeling in command of the moment. And I don't mean that in a crazy, creepy way, but more like if you're speaking as the funeral director to give instructions, know what you're saying and know what you're saying is correct and right. Lead with authority, with confidence, and people will listen. They want direction when they're there at the funeral home. They want to know what's happening next. Where should I go? When am I dismissed? What are we doing? They don't want to just wander aimlessly. So they're looking for direction. They're looking for someone to speak to them and to guide them. When you do it, then just do it with authority and with um, confidence. Like I said, I think that's super important. What made you want to be a funeral director? Um, you can watch some of my videos about how I became a funeral director and growing up kind of from the age of 16 in the business. Is there any advice given to a student that is new to this field and degree? Um, if you're a student, I hope that you have been around a funeral home prior to going to school and done some shadowing, at least know what the business is about. If you're investing money in something, I hope you have a good understanding of the full capacity of the role. Um, 
When my mom died of cancer, we donated all her long and low bouquets to the cancer wards. Yeah, so that's a great thing. Like if you're you have a funeral and you've got a bunch of flowers that people sent, um, the family obviously can take them home. But there's also like nursing homes and cancer um, or hospice facilities, places like that. They can take a larger bouquet and break it into smaller ones and kind of spread that love and you know the beauty to a lot of different rooms. They can have them in the entry to the facility. Some nursing homes will use them for their arts and craft time where um, residents can make their own little bouquet of flowers to take back to their room. So it, it is a event for them along with being something nice to have around. If the family doesn't bring clothing for the deceased, how does the funeral home handle the situation? If there's going to be a public viewing, the family needs to bring some clothing because we can't show them naked. We don't want them to be in just a hospital gown. Um, it used to be the thing that there was clothing for sale. It was burial outfits, big business and burial outfits. So you'd buy this like chiffony dress in either like pink or light blue or a man's, you know, the suit for the man. And it was your burial clothing, big business back in the day. Um, I don't know really funeral homes. I don't personally, None of the funeral homes I know um, sell these anymore. They may have a couple old garments um, in the back that never sold and you don't want to throw them out. A lot of places will have donated them at this point because they just want them out of their stock. But um, typically somebody's providing clothing. Um, we don't really want makeup. We acquire a lot of makeup and end up throwing away a ton of makeup. Um, you can donate clothing, but there are truly not that many people that need it. Truly, truly, truly. That don't need new clothing or anything. What do funeral directors do when a fellow funeral director passes away? Um, often, especially if it's in a community near you, you will go to visitation, show support for the funeral home. Sometimes they'll offer to help uh, that funeral home cover while they're having a funeral for somebody, you know, because the staff is all going to want to be part of the funeral for that person, but the phones and other families still need to be covered and served and everything and removals are still happening. So offering to help cover just like a police officer dying, then, you know, everybody wants to attend. Well, somebody has got to be policing during that. So you bring in people from other communities. And so offering to do those things is really kind Hello in North Carolina. My greatest generation parents were interred at Arlington National Cemetery. The Arlington ladies were immensely helpful in shepherding us through the protocol, which is awesome. My uncle died a couple years ago. He didn't have a suit. Fair Home offered to sell us one for $200. We went to Goodwill and found a suit, shirt, and tie for $14. Bucks. Yeah, you can go. Goodwill's great for that kind of stuff. Um, you can find really nice, gently used things. Brand new things sometimes that have tags on them that you can bring in. The funeral home, though, to take the time to send a staff member to go purchase something somewhere else, that's what a lot of the cost is. It's yeah, convenience for you to just say, okay, just use one of your suits. Otherwise, it's going to take time and shopping and all of that. So that's where not first is take care. Have you ever been part of a rural funeral service and culture? And have you noticed the difference between city and rural areas? Yes, I've worked in city and country and small town, big town, in between. Um, there's definite, but you can take two small towns that have like the same population and they're going to be wildly different. It's not even just a rural and urban, it's just community in general. Um, let's see, some questions for the cremation dude. Cremation dude, is that what we're going to call Josh, the <laughs> crematory operator? Um, I'll save these then for Friday for him. So what other questions do you guys have today? Um, I went live on my Facebook just a little bit ago talking about a conversation I had with a funeral provider in Cairo this morning, which was super fascinating. And I'm working on getting rid of some stock of my mugs, you know, like 
the coffee with Carrie or just give me two minute mugs. Um, so I have these $20 out the door includes the shipping, um, for today, but you have to post over on the Facebook to find out how to get them. Um, so if you're on Facebook, look for Carrie the Mortician, watch that video and you will be able to get mugs. Oh no, we call him Juicy Josh. Ju Juicy Josh, huh? That's kind of hilarious, um, Ida. I don't know how he would feel about that. He's He honestly has never done any camera stuff. So he was really out of his sorts last week. And some of the attention he's gotten from it has quite made him blush. Um, yeah. What are some products we can donate to funeral homes that'll help the funerals or family money? I, like I'm um, off the cuff, honestly, Shawnee, that's where, you know, clothing is not so much. Um, it's cost. It's cost of, yeah. Sometimes there's unclaimed individuals or people who know family and they, you may see a post from funeral homes that say, Hey, this service is going on. If you would like to attend to, just show support for this veteran or show support for this person who had nobody, you know, time can be a great donation um, as well. So just simple things like that. Is it possible for a loved one to never overcome their intense grief? Yes, Beth. Unfortunately, some people get stuck in their grief and in different phases. Some people may be stuck in depression, some stuck in anger, some stuck in complete denial that the person has really even left. And they live in this existence that they're coming back any moment now. They don't change their room. They don't change anything. They don't, they leave their clothes exactly the same way for years and years and years. And that is part of being stuck in a grief phase. So you can definitely get stuck. I have had a very brave friend who had a bad cancer diagnosis. She went and made arrangements herself at the funeral home, chose her clothing for a casket. Yes, it's amazing what some people do, do for themselves and how much they proactively get things in place. Some people don't ever want to have a conversation about it and just want to leave it up to the family because they don't, if you acknowledge that you may need a death plan, and a funeral plan, that means some people think that means that you've given up hope on survival. I like to think it's considering worst case scenarios so you're prepared for either. Some people really think if you give in to the thought that you might die of a diagnosis, then you've given up hope of survival. What do you guys think about that? Um, I can see it going both ways and I can see that mental battle of it. Uh, and thinking that there's maybe bad juju in it by talking about it even. I would like to do something nice for the funeral director who helped me last month. Elderly Poodle, I think that's awesome. Um, honest to goodness, send a thank you card. Send, you know, that is even a great start there. It is a great thing. I'm going to start my schooling to be just a director Will I be able to intern as a mortician while I'm employed? Low rider coach. It depends on your state. I think we've talked about, yeah, it just depends. Some schooling says you cannot work a full-time job and do your apprenticeship while you're going to school. So your apprenticeship can be different than an intern. There's a practicum in a lot of schooling, and sometimes they call that an internship, and that gets confused with your state run apprenticeship. So it just depends what you're kind of going for here. Um, you guys are hilarious with the Josh. Man, I would have had him on a video way sooner if I knew he was gonna, um, you guys were gonna be a fan. I say that a lot here at Custer, calls for people to go to vet funerals who have no family. Yeah, Christine, it's, um, I'm gonna have one coming up for a gentleman who's un unclaimed and we're going to be burying him at Fort Custer. And I'm going to kind of call on some veteran organizations to try to have some people there to um, lay him to rest properly. 
Um, everyone dies at some point. Having a death plan is a good idea. Yeah, it, it really is. However, um, a lot of people don't want to face that. And I can see that too. Can a mortician work on a close family member, like their children or husband or wife? Of course. I um, took care of my niece. I took care of my grandparents. Yes, definitely. Ooh, what would be a reason if one that a funeral, that a home would refuse to perform a funeral other than just money? I think that was the main point of my, one of my lives just recent. So scroll through my lives, my coffee chats too, Keith, to get a more in-depth, but um, the director not connecting with the family, the family being um, violent, aggressive, um, rude, things like that are, are along with the money thing, would be the main parts. Could you explain the chemistry of the embalming process and what happens to the tissue? Does the chemical saturate tissue or turn into a gas form to preserve? So formaldehyde is a gas. And so it's in a vehicle, a liquid, to move it through the body. And that's why the chemical is water. The solution is water-based to get it through the body. And then once it's there, it goes out into the tissue to preserve. And that's its job. Um, so that's why you want to get it distributed to as many areas as possible so then it can go out into the tissue. Stronger the solution, the more it's going to preserve out into the tissue. Is Josh single? I, we're not going to start a Josh dating site. No. <laughs> you guys are so funny. My mom, when she was diagnosed with gastric cancer, all she heard was six months to live. And she was gone in three weeks. I truly believe if she had hope, she would have been around. You know, I think a lot of it is a mental game. And I hate to use the word game, but it is. I think what you put in mentally drives you. I'm a worst case scenario person. So I like to run all the scenarios, especially the worst case ones, just in case and have that like plan on a shelf and then live life towards the better. Also have that on the shelf thing. You know what I mean? So yeah, I think it's fascinating. Uh, I lost my dad a little over a month ago, and the funeral home we used were wonderful. Devin, that's so good to hear. Um, I think with all of the negative we hear about funeral stuff, I love getting positive, and I like hearing that you and your family were cared for. You were cared for well. You felt you were cared for well. Your loved one looked good. They, you, you had a good experience. You didn't feel like you were taken advantage of or robbed or you know, treated poorly. I like hearing those stories along with the negative because that gives me, you know, good feelings about the business I'm in. Maybe you should offer Josh Merchant. What would Josh, Josh merchandise look like? I don't even know what that would look like. How about those bodies found in the Fisk coffins with alcohol? I'm not sure. We haw with Robin, we ha. That's fun to say. Um, I'm not sure what those are. Hey, Brad. Even though you are Cody. Oh, you're from Cody at Wyoming. Oh man. Um, welcome to your first live. Great job on the weakest link. Thank you guys. Yeah, that was very surreal watching myself, but I found watching it going. Ooh, maybe this answer will be right this time <laughs> instead of losing. Maybe I have a chance to win. It was like, well, maybe, just maybe, just maybe. What is the worst body you had to deal with? I guess worse in what capacity? Are viewing still performed at families' homes? Not often. It is, I think, more regional. You know, like Amish communities will take their loved ones home. Um, so some of it is situational, regional, cultural. It's not very common around where I am. 
Faces of the Forgotten channel. Okay, I'll have to check that one out. Uh, we have. That would be good. Um, did I do a two minute on Fisk coffins? I feel like it was on my list and I don't know. It's now been, I was talking to somebody the other day or earlier today. It's been two and a half years now with two minute videos. So that's what 104 plus, I mean, it's like 150 you know, plus two minute videos. So I am losing track of the ones I have done a little bit, a little bit. I do have my lists. I'm making a list today of the next two minute videos I need to be doing. So if you guys have any two minute ideas, two minute ideas. I always ask this and people give me videos that would take like two hours to do two minute ideas where it's me talking for a quick two minutes on a topic. So do you advise a non-viewing as my mom had a closed coffin with no visitation as he said she died painfully and not to view? Pain typically is not on the face of the deceased. Everything relaxes. That makes no sense to me, Sharon, honestly. Um, yeah, I don't know about that one. Thank you, Kathy. Um, that was, yeah, it was kind of trippy watching myself. Have you ever had to care for people that passed before a big occasion, wedding, graduation, birthday, um, before like mine? big occasions or like before theirs. I did take care of a girl and she died a few weeks before her own wedding. Um, one of the saddest, saddest um, funerals I have probably done in terms of the people there. You know, you're ramping up for this big, huge, wonderful moment in somebody's life and it ends. Um, it's, it's that huge swing of emotion. I think that makes it even worse for people when you're ramping up for some, or like right before graduation, um, car accidents, things like that, that we've had right before graduations with high schoolers and things. Um, also again, I think because you're in this positive, wonderful life moment upswing that the crash down on the other side is even worse. How long did it take? comfortable with finding and raising arteries and veins. I'm in more school and helps with tendon ball veins, but it's really hard to find them sometimes. It's still, you find a lot of funky bifurcations. Things are not always in the exact same place for every single person. So it's those variables that make it challenging. What I found, Amy, is knowing how to lay out your landmarks. You know, you take that aneurysm hook, you point it from the ear to the heart and know that that's your line. Almost every time, this is your line of where it's going to be running. Know that your nerve, artery, and veins are in a specific order in your neck. So if you find one, you know which way you should be going to find the other. I do a lot by feel. One thing when I have students is I make them not look, stick their finger in, and use their finger to find the artery. It is a very distinctive feel to an artery. You can find it by feel. And that way, if you've broken a vein and the, the hole, the incision keeps filling with blood and you can't see anything, you still know what it feels like in there. So even if you can look and see, do it by feel. Because once you know how to do it that way, you're golden. And yes, it's going to be challenging sometimes to find arteries. Definitely. Because they may be covered, they may be out of the way, they may just be deeper or to the right, to the left, anywhere. There can be challenges. But if you figure out your base way of finding, you're good. <laughs> Thanks, Dennis. Yeah, I like to go giggle a little too much, probably. Um, little girl found in Fisk coffin, died in 1800s. They said preserve an alcohol. You're going to keep an eye out for a single funeral director in his 50s for me. Any updates? <laughs> oh, my gosh. And it's crazier because I feel like sometimes I think, wow, 50. Do I know anyone that's that old? I'm not that far from 50. So it's really not old at all. Um, 50s. I'll have to think. I don't even. I know people from so many different places. Funeral directors all over the place. Um, and I guess I don't know a lot of them if they're married or not. Because I don't 
question, you know, like people on Facebook that I'm friends with and stuff. That's funny. Brian, just curious if my comments come through. Yes. How long after death do the color of these eyes change? They can change pretty quickly. They get cloudy. They get lighter. Brown eyes can turn to blue. It's pretty crazy to see. How do you stay positive or happy on someone's worst day? Um, it's not, a, you know, their loss. It's not my loss. So that's the biggest thing is I have nothing to be sad about that day. Nothing. Because it's not my loss. I'm doing, I'm at work. I'm doing my job. Yes, somebody has died. Yes, somebody's going to be sad, but it's not me. Yes, there can be days I I am sad by a loss or feeling for, you know, it's it's just compassion that you feel for a family, but I distance quite a bit of that or else it's not good quality of life for the funeral doctor if they're constantly in this emotional toilage, is that the right word, uh, every day. How do you stay positive or happy on someone's? I thought the blood didn't flow if the heart wasn't beating. It does not. The blood is in motion though, and it can have pressure built up. So as soon as you nick that vein, it's coming out because often it'll pull up from the head and around the heart. And so it's, there's a lot of pressure there. And so that's why it comes out. Oh my gosh, Josh merchandise could be barbecue lighters, the kind used to light candles because he works at a crematory. Oh my goodness. That, that's interesting. That's interesting. I would not, I have to take a picture of that because I'm going to have to send that idea to him. That's hilarious. Where did that go? Josh merch. Oh my gosh, I've got to send that to him. I was just at the crematory yesterday getting some stuff and chatting with him about doing the video on Friday. So um, I see him maybe three times a week or so at the crematory and at the funeral home and everything. That caskets with sway bars are generally more expensive than those with fixed bars. Any truth? Yes, it is. Um, it's going to cost more for the hardware to create the, the swing than it is solid bars. Um, so it is definitely something that adds a little cost. Have you ever taken care of family or close friends? Many um, people that I've known along the way, I took care of my niece. I took care of my grandparents. I've taken care of close family friends. So definitely have taken care of a lot of people. If someone has a life insurance policy on someone who has passed, are they responsible for the funeral bill? No, not at all. Or a Josh shirt that says, let me, <laughs> let me warm you up. Oh my gosh, I can tell. I The, the Josh fan club is alive and well. Um, oh my gosh. So don't be too crazy on Friday when y'all are watching him. He gets, he's going to get all blushy and stuff. Is the crematory? I'm not at the funeral home. Tasha, I'm not sure what that means. Oh, Sandy, that's an excellent question. So do you have to go through like a mental exam or make sure that you won't get affected with this job? Like at my job in the nursing home, they asked, don't get used to the residents. Um, yes. So we do not really go through any kind of a mental exam or anything. Before we go to mortuary school, they look at our background. They look at um, kind of felonies, things like that. But there's no real way to mentally know if someone can handle this or mentally know if someone is in tune with this kind of a business. And it can change. You may be good for a few years and then may not be. And it could all be one family you work with or one event in your own life leads it you to not be able to handle things. So COVID can happen and the whole business could get up and changed. So you just can never know what is going to happen along the way that could affect how it all happens. Where is the crematory? What crematory? 
I know where you are coming from. My work at a skilled nursing facility. No worries. I'd adjust chasing you. Um, what time is your appearance with Josh Friday? I'll mark my calendar. Uh, probably around 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, just like last week's. So that 4 o'clock time seems to work pretty good. So um, we'll go live and you guys can ask all your questions. Um, we were kind of talking about things maybe we didn't talk about in the first one that we can show or talk about in this one. We're not going to show the inside of the retort. That's something that, you know, even if there's a little residual of any cremated remains in there, that's still someone's loved one. So it's not really appropriate. The cremulator is not really appropriate to show inside and stuff. We can't show a body being processed. So there are things we can't show. Um, so if there's things you want to see that you feel you want to ask if we can see, definitely ask. Um, the worst we're going to say is no, that's not an appropriate thing. So when you guys know me, if you've watched my channel, I'm very hard, hard, fast at the not disrespecting a deceased um, and not showing things that are related to any one deceased. So that answers that, I guess. <laughs> so bring your questions, come up with some good ones. Um, appreciate your guys. Uh, let's see, do most caskets have adjustable beds that can raise and lower? Um, most do, but some do not. Some may just have a board that comes to one position and a lower position a much simpler mechanism, but still allows a bit of adjustment. Um, some have a wire or mesh type of bed. Um, so a few different varieties, but some do not adjust at all. And that of course is a cost thing. The lower cost means some things are gonna be a little more simplistic within that casket. If you were queen for a day, what big change you would, you may, oh, Dennis, I know exactly what this answer is. I would make all the laws for this business the same in all the states here in America. Same everywhere. So it's not like a, okay, in Utah, this happens, in Delaware, this happens, in Michigan, this happens, and across the board, same licensing, same schooling, same laws and rules about everything. It would make it so much easier to work and facilitate and answer questions. So because I try and answer your questions well, but when there's, you know, so many different responses I could give, it's hard to know where you're at and what the appropriate answer for your state is going to be. So, yeah, that's what I would do with Queen for Queen for a Day. All right. No, I've never gotten inside a casket except for the one I built from Fiddlehead Casket Company. So, oh, thank you. Call me gorgeous. Um, one more question. I'll answer Lauren's here. Um, how do you usually pick up a loved one from the hospital? Do funeral directors go right to the hospital or do they send them to the medical examiner? No, they don't go to the medical examiner typically unless they need to have an investigation. But if they're in the care of a facility for 48 hours, it's straightforward that they go to the morgue, then the funeral home will send staff over. Some states, it has to be a licensed funeral director that does the removal. Some states, it doesn't matter. See, there you go. Two different type of things. Um, the entrance to the hospital to the, go to the morgue is typically by the dumpster. Not always, but it is a huge Haha, ha, in our business, because it's typically by the dumpster and the loading docks. And if you say, hey, I just got back from the dumpster area, we know you were at a hospital. Like, it's crazy train. Um, and so to the hospital, often they may only send one person because you'll have maybe someone there to assist from the security team. Um, but that's how we, we do it. All right, I'm going to go. Thank you, guys so much. I will see you Friday around four o'clock Eastern Standard Time and Josh will be there too. So love you guys. You are so funny. Uh, see you then. Bye.